opportunities to startups. Uh, you know, I'd say it's a very interesting area, and I think there'll be a lot of opportunity. Thanks. So let's take some questions. I um. I wanted to ask you, does it, do you have to be a former banker in order to work out how to monetize the cloud? Because I thought up until now, kind of sharing computers was, was a kind of, you know, let's just share, right? You know, is it, is it, a kind of, you know. But what you're saying is that you basically, anybody with a computer can share it and make a bit of money out of it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it, the, the idea of sharing computers and distributed computing has been around for a while. Yeah. Uh, who here remembers SETI at home? Yeah, folding at home? Yes. You guys still running it? There's not many hands, but actually, I think I, you could go to like the SETI or the folding websites and they have stats. There's, there's like a million PCs still running SETI at home, right? So pe people are still, they're still doing this. And SETI at home, this technology has been around 10, 15 years. Um, so, so for those who don't know, can you explain what SETI at home did? So SETI at home, SETI is a search for extraterrestrial intelligence, right? Um, so, you know, guys that, that think that there's intelligent life out there, um, had and, and you know real legitimate researchers uh, had a lot of problems getting grants to go and do the number crunching on the data that they get from radio telescopes and all that. Right. So they came out a great way, uh, kind of like a volunteer computing project where they take bits of this data and uh, you know this again this is like 10, 12 years ago. Uh, you could go to their website, download the little processing engine that ran in, in the screen on the on the computer. Um, and you could do the processing. Cool. So they didn't need any money. They didn't need to go and buy a supercomputer. Uh, they just took all the computing money. So in a way, this kind of model is, is very similar to that. It just does a few things. One is um, it makes it more generic. Um, so with the set at home, you have to have this particular client and only things that, that will fit into that environment will work. Um, with Sliceify, we basically create a, a Linux server on every machine. So anything that you can run on Linux, you can run on this platform. It's 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 a very open and generic. Okay, let's take any questions. Any questions? Uh, okay. No, we're going to come back to you. You're the city at home man. We'll come back to you. <laughs> uh, I just looked up your website, and yeah. I I've seen like you. Uh, there is um, servers listed with the CPU configuration only. Are you going to move on to like a GPU uh, computation uh, in the future? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Like um, you know, for, for a lot of processing, GPUs are more efficient. Um, the challenge that we have at the moment is that virtualization of GPUs is not really there in the mainstream. Um, so, so, so virtualization. Who knows what virtualization is? All right, I, uh, so virtualization. This is like a real lecture. Yeah, it's yeah, great. Who knows what virtualization is? All right, so virtual, virtualization. <laughs> You've passed your SATs. Virtualization is just a, a, a secure way to share hardware resources on the same machine, right? So, so this is the technology that powers our, our software and, and a number of other cloud products. Um, now, CPUs actually have. What's a CPU? So, so the central. <laughs> So, so I just gave you a dictionary. Yeah, 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 so yeah, I'm doing it benefit the others if you haven't done. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so, so you know, the, the central, the central uh, processing unit in in your your desktop or mobile actually has embedded instructions to do this stuff now, right? Uh, but they haven't really filtered down to graphics cards yet. Um, so a lot of the people who are trying to use graphics cards for doing um, you know scientific pro, uh, you know uh, computation and things. Uh, I, it, it, it's somewhat restricted, so there's some, some security issues if, if that's not in place. That being said, um, NVIDIA, which is um, you know, the biggest uh, maker of these, uh, independent maker of these uh, graphics cards, actually has virtualization now on its, its top end cards. Um, so I, I could see that filtering down in the next couple of years. So you know, this, this technology will be able to apply to graphics so cards. So it seems to me it's very useful for people in the 3D you know, move movie industry. Who amongst your clients is that? Is that who's, who are the biggest users? Is it the well, is it, it the people who have got it's issues it's rendering, or is it's it? a very it's a very uh, sort of open general purpose platform. So we you know we have people that are, are running uh, something called World Community Grid, which is like a really a successor to the to the SETI at home. 
it's really just a new version of that. Um, and they're using that for doing things like, um, you know, uh, molecular dynamics for trying to find cancer cures. Um, you know, we have people who are using it for mining altcoins. Uh, we have people who are using it for rendering. Um, you know, we have people who are looking into using it for um, network monitoring because, you know, we have machines in 50 odd countries. We have more we have machines in more countries than any other country. Right? So if you want to know whether your website is successful in China, you can just go to my website, find a machine in China, jump onto it and check. There's not like nobody else can do that right now. So, um, you yeah, know, there's a lot of different uses. All right, let's take a question from a real SETI user. When I look at your price of about one cent per hour right now, I'm wondering how your users that are running your software are offsetting their energy costs. If yeah. I think renting out my computer back home in Germany, for example, for one cent an hour, I would lose money. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it depends a lot on where you are and the space of your computer. So, so one thing is, again, as I said earlier, at the moment we don't use graphics card. And then the biggest drain of power in your computer is your graphics card at the moment, right? Um, if you go, I, I, uh, there's a couple of links on the website, um, but I think the UPenn study uh, took a watt meter and went around a number of different machines and measured it. And you know, something like a, a modern day desktop, if you have an i5 or i7, uh, you're going to be using, I mean, they ran the SETI client on it, uh, which is probably a similar kind of workload to what we have. Um, and they were getting like 75, 80 watts, right? So it's. It, you know, okay, if you, if you use a five-year-old computer, they're going to be like 200, 300, right? But modern computers are, are way more power efficient. Um, so, so, so that's one thing. Um, and then the other thing is, I think Germany in particular has very high electricity rates. Um, one of the things that we're finding is that we get a lot of interest from users in Eastern Europe, where electricity rates are much lower. Um, so, you know, I did some calculations back when I was setting this up, and, and I think like two cents an hour is kind of an average. Um, can be anywhere from one to three or four. Um, you know, I think there's, you know, I, we, don't, we don't have any clients in Iceland. Uh, I think Iceland has the world's most expensive electricity. Um, so we take one more question. Is there any more questions? No? I have a question. It's kind of not really connected. Where do computers go to die? <laughs> Because you just made me think that if I can resuscitate all my old computers and put them to work. So are you finding that because, you know, loads of people... Well, it, actually, it, funny enough, it goes back to the same question. There's a point at which the electricity cost of running your machine versus the performance that you get out of it, um, it just doesn't make sense. All right. Uh, at the moment, I'd say there's, there's like probably a three, four year time window. So if you have a PC that you've bought in the last three, four years, you, you can make money out of it. Uh, anything older than that is too slow for you to make that. And is your, is your business a bit like uh, you need that ecosystem that Troy was talking about at Evernote? I mean, you're, you're providing a platform, right? Surely you need to have yeah, a whole I, bunch of people build apps or whatever it is off the back of it to make it sustainable. Yeah, I mean, uh, right now, as I said, it's, it's only been out for a couple of months. Um, you need to be a programmer ready to use it. We, we have a bunch of open source examples, but you know, the, the average person on the street wouldn't really get much use out of it. You have to be kind of a, a nerd to, to, to use it. Uh, that being said, once we have, we, you know, we now have those few hundred machines, we have the infrastructure. Um, you know, the next logical thing for us to look at is how do we turn that into a platform, open it up to developers. Um, you know, how do we make it easier for people to use? Um, so that's something that, that we'll be looking at uh, later this year. So one more, because we're talking about the future. There was a lot of talk in the past about thin computers. Do you, are you saying that where this, the whole direction is going, that basically you won't need to have much computational power on whatever gadget you're wearing, whether it's your glasses or your shirt that talks to you or your watch or whatever? Is it all going to move? Yeah, the cloud? Uh, yeah, I think a large chunk of it will, will move. Um, you know, I, think, I think the limiting factor right now is probably internet bandwidth, right? Um, you know, it's... it's it's, it's not a fluid experience to watch a high-def movie in real time over the internet on a thin device. Um, but, you know, bandwidth is going up every year. And, you know, I think, I think it, you know, it's only going to be a pretty short uh, time before, you know, the, again, you won't need anything on your device. It will just be HTML5 in the browser. Uh, Excellent. Right. Round of applause to Steve. Good stuff, man. Thank you. Right, I've been walking around, so why don't you all have a quick stretch? Why not all stand and have a quick stretch just to get the blood going? Go on, stand.
before the next one. It's all about sitting in the back of a taxi, so have a quick stretch. Let's have a little uh, 10 second stretch while I say sit up. I mean, this is a huge, huge market that hasn't changed in decades. And that 1.2 million rise represents over 60 million Hong Kong dollars a day in revenue. So you can see why we're so excited to be playing in the space in Hong Kong here. But again, you know, it's just not ideal how we all get our taxi today. You know, so what we're trying to do is create a marketplace. That's what we do. We're not a taxi company. Lots of times we go to markets, the governments go, well, we don't need another taxi company. You know, but we're not a taxi operator. We are a marketplace that is creating efficiencies between an underutilized asset, in some cases, a driver, and a passenger who has an immediate demand. So what we're trying to do from a technology standpoint, and where you're seeing a lot of the market's growth in the world, just not just taxis, but everywhere. You look at Airbnbs, you look at Ubers, you look at Bitcoin. The marketplace of matching buyers, sellers, supply, demand is really where tech is connecting all of us and making all of our lives more efficient today. So you've got the passenger, you've got the driver, and we just jump in the middle and make that interaction that much more relevant and easy for all of us. But again, I mean, we talk about technology a lot, and I think this is a part that gets missed by a lot of companies, um, at, least, at least like ours. There's a huge operational element to this. And so in order to scale effectively and efficiently, people just want to say, oh, you know, we've got the best technology, we've got the best idea, but you know what? If you're thinking about starting a business, it's all about the execution. And when you're going into technology and you're going into a new market, that adoption curve, yeah, you've got your early, you know, your early adopters. But that growth curve is not the same for everybody. To me, it makes a ton of sense. Why would you not get your taxi through an app? I don't have to go wait out in the rain. I don't have to go wait out on the line. I can watch my taxi come to me. But yet, only seven people are in this whole room use the taxi app to book a taxi. So you might think you have the best product. And you might think the world, the future for technology is today, but there's a lot of execution that goes behind that in getting everybody on board. And there is a tipping point. You saw it with Facebook, it started slow, but there's a network effect. But it takes time and a lot of offline execution. So this is just a few of the different things we've done in Hong Kong to kind of get our name out there. Obviously not to the student base very well yet, <laughs> but, but we're working on it. So what's next? We talk about the future. That's what we're here for. But I, in a lot of ways, I think the future is now. It's just about embracing what's in front of us. So sure, our, our app will have lots of new features. And, and these already exist in other, feature, or other apps like us, like the Uber, right? So you'll see in-app payment. You'll see advanced booking. You know, you'll see direct messaging with the driver. So you, know, you see the taxi coming to you on the screen, but maybe you think that he's not coming or another taxi's coming. You can use a, a WeChat or a Viber to go back and forth. Um, you're going to be able, at least through our app, in the next couple months, be able to use Facebook, Foursquare, Yelp, Google Places, all of these to actually select the location you are. So you don't have to type in anymore where you are exactly. Even though the GPS locates you, that will automatically pop up. And then different types of loyalty programs. So these are new features we're looking at. But then I think a lot of it, and uh, Troy alluded to it, is finding new channels, finding new partners. That's how you grow your business. Um, you know, we're looking at different things like integrating via other apps where you could just book right through. So the messaging system. So Didi and Fast Taxi in China do this with WeChat and Alipay, right? So we're looking at doing this as well. Different APIs for hotel partners. Um, we've got a corporate product, a retail product coming out. Um, obviously wearables, wouldn't it be cool, you know, if you had Google Glass on and it would identify that one of our easy taxis is coming towards you and you could just say something and it would flag it down right there. You don't even have to do any booking. So these are all things that are possible. I can't tell you what's going to come exactly, but everything is possible and it's not that far off. But really what the consumer is looking for is, as I mentioned, a ubiquitous experience. The consumer doesn't care where they get it. They want it everywhere and they want it to feel the same. They want it to operate the same. So in retail, you talk omni-channel a lot of times. You talk physical presence, online presence, mobile chan mobile presence. You want to have all of it together. So the taxi space will be the same. I mean, we want it, you to be able to get the taxi wherever you are at any point, no matter how you want that taxi. So as you think about tech and what the future lends itself to, it's this interconnectedness of bringing all of these elements in your life 
that maybe you feel a pain point where it's not working so well, and it's the company's job to bring it to you in a way that is seamlessly integrated into what you do. So I went through this pretty quickly so we could answer some questions. I know we're a few minutes behind, but the reason I wanted you to download our app, not only to use it today, but if you did and you come up to me while I'm still here afterwards, I've got a coupon for you for $22 off your next taxi ride if you book it with Easy Taxi. So, um, shameless plug here, but there's a voucher code, you just put it in the reference line, um, come up, talk to me, I'm happy to share this with you. Uh, we've been in Hong Kong about four months, we've got 6,000 taxis, is the service perfect? No, it's, but we're scaling very quickly and growing, so happy to take any questions and thank you very much. For me? Ten minutes. How are you lucky? So, um, this is really chilling. I can see this working. We've got Evernote, where you put all your addresses and where you're going, all your mates. We've got Sliceify saying, put it all in the cloud and just hang around with batteries at last. And we've got you saying, you know, Taxi will turn up when you need it, when you're about to fall off the pavement and hit the floor. So I can see the future coming together really nicely here. And we've got the students who are going to do it, use it all, right? So do we have any questions here? Ah, no. Hey, I forgot about that, mate. Sorry. The most geeky guy in the room is going to ask you the hardest question. We don't take bitcoins. <laughs> Well, I don't have Bitcoin, so it's yeah. fine. Um, you mentioned about uh, WeChat and Alipay already did something similar yes. for Taxi, and mm -hmm. they already did like 21 million rise last month. Yes. So uh, how are you going to think you're going to compete there and compete with them, not just in China, I mean Hong Kong, when it's starting to push their uh, WeChat uh, add-on right. to Hong Kong markets? So Tencent and Alibaba um, both invested about 100 million US dollars in the two big competitors in China. For us, we've been in discussions both with Tencent and Alibaba as well as Didi and Fast Taxi. And their plan isn't necessarily to come to Hong Kong right now. What, what Tencent and Alibaba, they, they want their payment method via WeChat and Alipay. That's why they invested in They don't care about taxis. I mean, yes, it's, it's a way to get their payment system out there. For, but them, it's a distribution channel. They're not a taxi operator. So we're not concerned at this moment about them. Another thing I want to mention about payment now, uh, Octopus going online and using Alipay as well, would you consider having a partnership with them? I actually met with Octopus this morning. You poor sod. I've met them several times. They're, 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 their heads are in the cloud, the wrong cloud. Uh, but but yeah, yeah, yes, we're, we're, we're building in-app payment right now. We wanted to launch the product so everybody could use it. Um, there's no fees to use it yet, but we will have in-app payment in the next two months and we want everybody to have as many channels to pay as they want.